own your own home is part of the American dream. But more and more Americans are finding they can't afford the house of their dreams. And experts say chances are they never will. Tonight, we will show you houses you can afford and the ones you can't. Then Joe Abril interviews the stars of the new hit movie Silver Streak, Gene Wilder and Richard Pryor. And we're going to teach you how to ride a bicycle the right way, not for balance, but for safety. These are the scenes we bring together for tonight's montage. Good evening, I'm Ralph Rennick. Americans tend to think of housing as a basic right. But here in South Florida, it's fast becoming a right many of us cannot afford. Maury Olicker reports. Thinking of buying a house? If you don't already have a place of your own, you probably cherish the dream of owning your private little castle on your own piece of land. Chances are you know that single-family homes cost more today than ever before. The average new house in Dade County sold for about $30,000 in 1971. This year, the price is 53000 Face it, inflation hits hard at the cost of housing. The cost of materials has jumped dramatically. The available land for building has decreased substantially because, and rightfully so, people are concerned about the environment and, and municipal officials and county governments are preventing people from building in land that may be endangered or may affect the environment. So the value of land has increased. We've also seen an enormous investment in land by people outside of the country, and this further inflates the value of land. Labor has gone up considerably. All sorts of materials. There are many petroleum-related products that go into a house. Uh, we've seen the price of steel perhaps jump 50% in the last three years or two years. And, uh, and I think this reflects itself ultimately in that uh, the price of a house is, is the sum of all its parts. Sandy Myatt is vice president of Arvita Corporation, one of South Florida's largest and most successful builders. His current project is Sable Chase, a development of cluster-type apartments and single-family homes in Kendall. Top of the line here is this slightly palatial model that starts at $103,000 and runs even higher with optional extras. That's a little steep, you say? Well, for a detached single-family house, the lowest price you'll find here is $66,000. That gets you three bedrooms, two baths, a two-car garage, and a very nice kitchen. 1,600 square feet of living space. But 66 grand? And they're selling. Who can afford to buy? What we're finding is that the typical purchase, purchaser is a young professional where both husband and wife are working, and their combined income qualifies them for any mortgage. In addition, in some cases, we're seeing parents or other members of families assisting these people. Um, Single-family homes, as you know, has traditionally been the dream of the American family. Uh, for the most part, people have a fear, and they've seen it. They can track it over the years that housing is getting beyond their means, and people are stretching and buying these homes at the current time. You can buy a new home for less, but the brutal fact remains that for a great many people, especially young couples just starting out, a new home is an out-of-reach dream. So what's left? People who whose income prevents them from buying homes like these will either rent apartments or will choose some alternate source of living, such as living in one of a village, our village homes or town homes. In addition, in rare cases, they may seek out and find a very inexpensive home that's relatively old. That's a builder's perspective. Actually, resale of used homes in South Florida accounts for more sales than all other housing transactions combined. But the heavy demand and high cost of new homes is in turn driving up the cost of used homes. That's good news for the seller, says Miami Review real estate editor Charles Kimball. Well, the dominant factor is the used home, the existing house. And of course, most of the people who are looking for single family homes uh, end up buying uh, an existing house from somebody who's selling. And in spite of the real estate recession we have had here for two years, this uh, tremendous demand just by people who are working and who are living here, the majority that is, has kept the prices of used homes going up and up and up uh, and kept this market very healthy in spite of all the other problems. Would you say it's a seller's market right now in used homes? It's still uh, a seller's market in almost all parts of South Florida. But still, the used home may be the only choice for families anxious to get their own piece of terra firma but lacking the wealth to buy something new. Currently, the bulk of used house sales falls between thirty and forty thousand dollars. What does that price buy? We asked Ruth Young of Cousins and Associates Realty in Coral Gables. 
Ruth, the price tag on this house is under $40,000, and it's certainly something that you couldn't get from a, a new builder nowadays. Uh, so this might be typical of what the family that couldn't afford to buy a new house would be looking at. Why don't you tell us about it? Yes, um, this is 39.9, and uh, it's in excellent condition, and it has many things a new house even doesn't have. Uh, with the beautiful landscaping, well taken care of, immaculate condition. Uh, it really is a very good buy and better really than buying a new house because you might have to have the extra money to do many of the landscaping and uh, much of the uh, fixing up as these people have done. What the house doesn't have is a lot of space. The rooms are small. Another house at this price might have more room but could be in less than perfect condition or it may have a less desirable location. But these are opportunities for young couples to own a first home and chances to realize a profit as even inexpensive homes by today's inflated standards increase in value. The used housing market also offers something for the family that can afford a new home but wants something more. This is a house we have for sale for 75000 It's a three bedroom, it has a den, a pool, it has a beautiful neighborhood. Um, the ideal thing about this house is the surrounding houses that are being built go up over $150,000. So it's a very good location for this price range and so your value should stay there. It has uh, excellent condition. It was built in 62, but there would be no way that you really could tell that. Uh, it just has uh, been kept so beautifully. It has sprinklers and all the uh, luxury features that you would want with a double garage. And what about condominiums? If you don't have your heart set on detached housing, that's where to find the bargains. Not long ago, the Florida myth said that buyers who couldn't afford a new house would turn instead to multi-unit complexes. Builders invested in that idea, but they guessed wrong. Buyers, panicked by the astronomical increases in single-family homes, rushed to buy them before they went even higher. That left many apartment builders high and dry, with huge inventories of unsold units on sale at bargain basement prices. Of course, many builders went bankrupt in the recession. And it might surprise you to know that even at today's inflated prices, builders of new homes are walking on thin ice. There has been a major failure of a builder in Dade County, one of the top 11 builders just went under. And the reason is simple. If you look at the uh, reports, the annual and quarterly reports of listed major builders like Lennar and Development Corporation of America, you'll see that for the most recent periods, their profit margins have been from 1 to 3 percent. And that's all they're making on the homes they're selling. The reason being that there's so much competition from uh, distressed condominiums, which have been discounted 30 to 35 percent. And there's so many small builders trying to get in on this good market that they cr created a very competitive price situation. And though prices are moving up, it's, they've had to go up to keep with land costs. And uh, therefore, the, any builder who makes one mistake in his planning, his cost uh, controls, could go under. And that's what's happened. So if you're still hanging on to the American dream, better not hang there too long. It's going to get worse. But there is no question in my mind that uh, the price of that $103,000 home could in five years be $150,000. And it might not even be as big at that point. Well, uh, who's going to buy it then? If people are stretching to buy it now, what's going to happen to your market? Well, obviously, with inflation, people's salaries will go up. Uh, but surely it will not go up uh, at the same rate that inflation has gone up over the years or will go up in the future. And there'll be less and less people who will be able to afford a home like that. And they will have to compromise and go to the type of housing that is more multifamily in nature, housing that is much smaller. But I think the building industry and designers will tend to accommodate them. They will design homes differently. They will design homes with greater spaces that have multiple purpose use. You might see the elimination of a living room as a house in a home. You might see the elimination of a formal dining room as a particular room in a home. And a home might consist of solely a space that would be kitchen, breakfast, family room, all in one space, and some bedrooms and perhaps two baths. If you don't act now, it may be impossible to act in the future. So this is motivating many people, even in this slow period of real estate for South Florida, to move into single-family homes. Sales of new homes, for example, today are running almost 20 percent ahead of last year for the single factor alone. Just a fear of the future inflation which may take place 
California style. Bike riding in South Florida may be enjoyable, but it could be deadly. Over 700 Dade cyclists collided with automobiles this past year. Four of those bike riders died. The Dade County Public Safety Department says it's worried about the number of children involved in those accidents. So the department lectures elementary school students on safety rules and informs motorists when bike accidents occur. We have a serious accident reported at Northwest 135th Street and 22nd Avenue where a child was reportedly struck on a bicycle while en route to school. Emergency equipment is rushing to the scene now, so if you're in this area, please yield to that emergency equipment. Morning traffic reports similar to this one are broadcast by the Dade County Public Safety Department frequently. They say the cause of such accidents are the bike riders themselves, children who don't obey the rules of the road. If you've ever looked in the rearview mirror or uh, up ahead in front of your car, you usually don't see a bicyclist until you're right on top of them. And if they're being careless, they're riding side by side, they're talking, they suddenly decide that they want to make a turn in front of you, you don't have sufficient time to stop because you just don't see them. Many people have uh, their minds on other things. Sergeant Beach's observations proved correct, at least at Palmetto Junior High. In 10 minutes' time, 50 student cyclists plowed through a nearby intersection, ignoring stop signs and oncoming cars. On the other hand, we found younger students determined to follow bicycle safety rules. You don't ride your bike across the street. You wait till the safety patrol says to cross, and you walk your bike across the street. Why do you walk your bike across the street and not ride it across the street? Because if you ride it, you might, like, get hurt. And if you walk it, because you could get hurt if you don't obey the rules and you should cross on the green light or walk light. What else do you know? And um, in, when you come back from school, if you just rush across the street, a car might come turning and you could get hit like that. Do you always obey the rules all the time? Yeah, when I come to my street, I press the button and wait to walk light and I cross the street. Do all your other friends do that too? Yeah, sometimes my friend just runs across the street without looking. What do you tell him when he does that? I tell him, I, sometimes when I meet him, I tell him, why don't you wait till the walk light, like I do, and I... He, so, now I think he learned about it. You stop at the streets while you're crossing the streets, you stop and you look both ways, and then you cross when no cars are coming. Why do you do that? To make sure nobody, if a car is coming, you'll get hit if you're going across the road and they don't see you. Get off your bike before you cross the streets and, um, and obey the safety patrols. While you don't ride your bike across the street, you have to walk your bike. Bike riders making a left-hand turn can avoid merging with passing automobiles. Sergeant Beach explains. If you're riding on the roadway, you must obey the same rules as an automobile. Come to a stop sign, stop. Usually we won't tell children to turn left in traffic because it's hard enough many times for a car to turn left. And in busy traffic, we suggest that they get off the bicycle, walk it from the corner to the other corner using pedestrian safety rules, and then over to the direction they want to go. Remember, walk your bike across the street, then turn and cross again in the direction you want to go. But the question now arises, should you be riding on the sidewalk or the street? An adult should not be on the sidewalk. I believe that an adult usually knows the safe practices on a bicycle. They should know laws regarding traffic safety. They should ride on the, on the roadway where uh, there's sufficient room. I wouldn't suggest riding on a narrow roadway. Children, we usually ask them to be on the sidewalk. We also caution them that sidewalks are made for people walking, pedestrians. We ask them to yield to, to the pedestrians, be courteous, try to warn them with a bell or something, let them know that they're coming. But uh, above all, they're responsible, even on the sidewalk, uh, for safety rules. That safety rule again. Children should ride bicycles on sidewalks, adults on roadways. What side of the street should you be riding on? The side facing the traffic, or should you be moving side with of the, the street traffic? Which side you ride your bike on? The, si um, the right side. Why? Well, because well, the sidewalks are on that side. Left. Yeah. Why the left hand side? That's my best side. What do you mean by your best side? Like if I get on the right, you know, um, I don't feel right. So I ride on the left. The right? Why the right? 
cars so I can just look at my mirror when, I, when the car's coming on the back of, back of me. You ride on the street where you can see the car coming towards you. You ride on the, let's see, it depends which way you're going. The answer is always ride with the traffic, never on the side facing oncoming cars. One of the reasons is if a car hits a cyclist from the back, his chances of receiving severe injuries are much less than if he were hit head on. Towing someone on your bike may seem like fun, but it could be dangerous. Older kids, they'll tow on the handlebars of a bicycle, which would create a very serious problem if, the, uh, say, a bus was stopped on the side of the road picking passengers up or letting them off. Somebody's coming out of a driveway, the individual goes around the bus, and he has somebody on the handlebars, the guy has to stop suddenly to keep from hitting the car. The guy would probably end up flying off. He may get excited, get a foot caught in the front spokes. It would throw him off and the bicycle right on top of him possibly a chance of him being run over by the automobile at the same time. That rule once more, towing is both dangerous and illegal. Should you ride your bike after dark? The Public Safety Department discourages night riding for small children and warns all cyclists who do venture out past sundown to observe the law. Many of these accidents do occur at night. Uh, what we suggest, there are laws regarding bicycles as far as equipment on the bicycle. A reflector on the back, a headlight in the front. Usually, uh, working with uh, young people, we tell them we would prefer that you didn't ride by at night if possible. If you have to ride, make sure you have this equipment. It's required by law. Also, we could, could suggest uh, highly reflective tape on the back of a windbreaker, or as you've seen many times, a bicycle flag, anything for visibility. Additional gear to aid night riders includes a reflector which straps onto a cyclist's leg and a portable light. But if your bike is in poor shape, it doesn't matter how much equipment you have or how well you obey safety rules, accidents can still occur. Make sure your bike wheels have no loose or damaged spokes. Wobbly seats can turn the rider around unexpectedly. Handlebars and brakes should also be adjusted often. And worn pedals, which aren't replaced, could cause a cyclist's foot to slip. If you're unsure about bicycle safety practices, or if you just want to review the tips and rules of the road you've seen here tonight, Write the Florida Highway Patrol for a free bicycle safety brochure. The address, 2515 West Flagler Street, Miami, 33135. Silver Streak is a popular movie now playing in Miami. It's a comedy drama adventure film that takes place on a train from Los Angeles to Chicago. Joe Abril has just spent some time with the stars of that film. Here's a sample. Uh, I said, how's the latch? We have connecting room. The latch? Good, it's good, it's fine, thank you. It's a little bit rusty, but nothing serious. I'll get the porter to look at it. There's no rush, is there? Gene Wilder, in this scene with Joe Clayburgh, is generally known as a comedian. But in this movie, he's more serious than usual, and when I talk to him later, he obviously is very serious about himself as well. Do you think people know everything about you that you want them to know? You, uh... Oh, no. Well, what? A lot of things that I don't want them to know, too. Really? You're a private person in that regard? I'm private, and I'm also, um, I like, I like personal questions. I like intimate questions. I don't like private questions. I mean, things that I wouldn't want to tell to anyone. But I do like when there is a question that it be as specific as possible and personal. Well, OK. Do you feel any sort of personal obligation to the people who pay money to see you in a movie? Yes, I do. In what way? My contract is between the audience and me, not between the critics and me, but between the audience and me. And when I know that I've been working since 13 and now people say, ooh, Gene Wilder, oh boy, I hope it's good, I hope it's good, I don't want to let those people down because they're expecting a certain kind of movie. I also don't want to be boxed in that that certain kind of movie has to have a, a narrow alleyway, that it's only Blazing Saddles or only Young Frankenstein. I want there to be room for me to grow and expand within it, but laugh always. I always want them to laugh. Maybe cry, maybe, hopefully, but not at the expense of the comedy. Okay, out of acting and on the streets, do people come up to you and uh, if they do, of course they do, and ask if your autographs that bother you? Oh, no, that doesn't bother me. It, I, uh, it only tells me that people are seeing my movies. The only time it would bother me is uh, if I've been working very hard for 12 or 14 hours a day and I was sitting in a little restaurant and then they came up just and I'm just going to get my first bite full of food and someone said, can I have your autograph? I, 
I might say, would you wait till I get to dessert or something like that? But that, that doesn't happen that often. Are you involved in politics at all? Do you? When necessary. Public affairs? I mean, do you? Not public affairs, no. During the Vietnam War, I felt I, it was the first time that I became political. Um, and I, uh, I felt I had to do something, and I supported those people who I thought were going to make an end to the war. I saw a little trailer last night in which it was mentioned you perhaps were, uh, I don't know how to phrase this, but the, the comparison was made between you and Cary Grant. Is that yes, true? Yes, good idea? comparison. I mean, we have identical faces, we dress alike, I have you the you same both have, hair. You both. <laughs> <laughs> I always wanted to be Cary Grant or Errol Flynn or Tyrone Power in the movies. And I realized at a certain point it wasn't ever going to happen. And then I read the script, and because I was in enough movies that made money, they said, well, why not Gene? Gene could do it. So I get to be Cary Grant in North by Northwest, and I get the girl and have real, real love scenes, not just make-believe and cork in the eye and with, with a champagne bottle, but a real romance love scenes. And then Richie Pryor comes in, and I have a chance to do my real comedy. So I have the best of both worlds. Ah! Take it easy, killer. What are you doing here? What's going on? Who's in charge here? Would you get down? Richard Pryor is nearly impossible to interview, simply because he's more unpredictable than a child. You never know when he's serious and if what he's saying is true. Well, you listen to my talk with him and then tell me what's real and what isn't. I, you have been treated like a celebrity here. I'm really impressed. Well, you order up the... <laughs> from my shoe omelet and the man who goes to get it. <laughs> no, I saw in the biography they put out about you that you uh, walked Would off you the stage. Office? No, I love it here. <laughs> that you walked off stage in Vegas because I said you were playing a white audience. Is that true or is that no, just No, I hype? walked off stage because I'd lost 37,000 in the... A couple of boys in the back were doing this. Oh, he ran off the stage. You didn't walk. <laughs> There's no walking in the No, you mean that's not true? The thing in the biography that... Uh, I don't know. No, no, and why no. do they print those things? I don't know. I mean, they have nothing to do. I was there. I was working for the Catholics. I was there doing a bingo show. And I had a special bingo show. Just for real now you And I was doing a bingo show. <clears throat> and happened to be too many nuns in the audience. And they were always winning. And the audience thought that it was a fix. Sure. And they attacked me. So I left. I mean, I figured it was the only sensible thing to do. That's pretty good. Then I you started working more into black audiences. No, I went to play football. I went to try out for Denver. And... Uh, Got my leg hurt in practice, yeah. and I uh, couldn't continue my career as that. I Gee. went back into comedy uh, after I played a little basketball. Yeah, who'd you try out for? Or were you with the team? Well, I was with the Lakers for two weeks. Yeah, and then I was playing center, and uh, then uh, Wilt, uh, you know, got well and they hired Kareem Abdul. And I was out of that. That's time. really good, Richard. Is that your real name, Richard? Uh, no, my real name is Eric von Stickel und Spreitenberg. Are you German? No, I'm uh, from uh, Cleveland. The, the German section of Cleveland? Yes, I used to, okay. used to build cockpits. <laughs> for for, for, for little, planes or for, for cocks? For little planes. <laughs> okay. Planes. Okay. Well, yes. that's Richard Pryor. I don't think I could have condensed him better than he just did it for himself. Thank you and, uh, very much. It's a pleasure uh, having it's your arm around It's a pleasure uh, being with you and having my arm around you, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be right back. Next week, Montage takes a close look at chiropractors, those controversial medical practitioners who aren't really doctors, or are they? We'll also show you some of the problems of handicapped persons looking for jobs. And Joe Abel's guest will be Barbara Condos, a kept woman who wrote a book about it. That's our montage for tonight. This is Ralph Rennick. Good evening.